take a seat. We're going to go ahead and get started. All right, good evening. My name is Steve Evans, and I'll be moderating this evening. Welcome to Post 2466. Uh, they have graciously agreed to help us host. This is being put on by the Lubbock County Republican Veterans Association and the Constitutional Society. Thank you guys for coming. All right, we'll begin, uh, let me give you the, the rules right quick. We're going to do two-minute opening statements in alphabetical order. Uh, we'll then do 90-second questions, kind of in a round-robin fashion, and then we'll do our closing statements once again in alphabetical order. Mr. Arrington, if you'd like to begin with your opening great. statement. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great to hear, and uh, special thanks to the veterans. I appreciate your service to our country. For almost two decades, we have been blessed with the strong leadership of Bob Dunn. He put the interest of West Texans first, and he delivered results for our region. I grew up in Plainview, Texas. Grew up out here in West Texas. And my mom really was a school teacher. My dad really did sell tractors for 40 years, way back then. We had a great life here in West Texas. And uh, we were blessed, mainly because of the love of, of good parents and teachers that inspired me. Then I went to Texas Tech. I got two degrees from Texas Tech and then went to work for a guy named George W. Bush. I served with him as governor and then as president. And while I was working with him, I helped him assemble his leadership team in agriculture and energy. I also... Um, led efforts to downsize a, a federal regulatory agency. Hold your applause, please. And uh, also work to reduce regulatory burden on small banks. And I came back to West Texas, I came back home, and I served my alma mater. And I served as chief of staff and, and vice chancellor of Texas Tech, where I helped uh, bring new students in, thousands of new students, as chairman of the Enrollment Growth Task Force. And as vice chancellor, I brought millions of dollars in and good jobs to, to Lubbock and the surrounding area. I learned this in my experience. Leadership is about working with others to get things done. And I don't think we're doing enough in Texas to stop illegal immigration, to secure our future water needs, and to strengthen our public schools and universities. We need somebody who's going to put leadership over politics and the interest of West Texans above all. That's my record. That's what I've done. And if I'm elected as your Thank next you, senator, sir. that's what I'll do. Thank you all for inviting us. <laughs> Um, I'm just a regular common person, no, nothing special about me. Uh, the only thing I can say that's, uh, that's any special is uh, I'm a veteran. I captain U.S. Army Reserves. I've got 19 years of service right now. I started as an enlisted person, uh, and the reason I joined the military is because I was in a farm in Silverton, Texas, and there was no way I was going to go to college. Uh, today, I have a master's degree, and it's all because, you know, I joined the military like many of y'all. Uh, that GI Bill can do wonders and pull you from poverty. Uh, and you can be all that you can be or anything that you want to be uh, in America. Um, today I teach at William Baptist University. Uh, I teach leadership. Uh, so, you know, when we try to define leadership, got it. Um, I also work. Um, the Army taught me transportation, and that's, that's my full-time job. I'm an adjunct professor at Wayland Baptist University, by the way. That's, that's where I got my master's. And um, I'm a truck driver. I trade. I have a CDL, and uh, I have my own trucking company, so I know about uh, what small businesses go, go through, the payroll, the everything else you have to be to, to stay in business, you know, the, the taxes, the regulation. There's a lot of pieces, you know, where people can be successful or unsuccessful. And, you know, you just have to... Uh, Nobody taught me how to be a, uh, a businessman. You know, you just know, you invest, and you know, win or lose, that's what you do. But you know, the opportunities are there. Um, like I said, right now, I work for uh, a transportation, as a transportation coordinator for uh, Essence Bowling, and uh, that's all I do, inbound and outbound. So I know the transportation industry, and I know that's a problem uh, for us. And uh, other than that, I'm just proud to be an American. 
and uh, I appreciate your vote. I know some of y'all have already decided who you're going to vote for. You know, no matter what we say up here, you know, you're dead set on who you're going to vote for, and that's okay. You know, that's that's your right. Uh, I want to stop right now because the clock is fixing up. <laughs> Jones, I represented this area for 30 years in the legislature. I just took my background. I was born and raised here in Lubbock, born the son of a tenant farmer, and it was a tremendous honor to be in the legislature for 30 years. I did the med school bill, the hospital bill, got funding for Lubbock State School, and the funding for the law school, all sorts of things that Texas Tech asked for while I was there. And I supported every project that was ever presented to ask for by the leadership of Lubbock because that's what the job calls for. If you're going to be representative, you've got to be representative of the people, the constituents. And I'm always proud that I had a very open office, always dealt with constituents. That was the main thing I was interested in. <clears throat> I helped organize our plans, what it is. I helped prove that the underground water belonged to the service honor. I'm a strong contender that private property is private property. It should not be imposed on by gov government entities, and it should not be confiscated and sold to some commercial engineer. That is totally wrong. But I will continue to represent property owners. I will continue to look after agriculture members. I have organized so many different groups of agriculture people that try to better our position. I won't even try to enumerate. But overall, I passed over 100 pieces of legislation. That means it went through the House and the Senate and was approved by the government office. So I'm not inexperienced in dealing with the Senate, and I think I'll be well qualified, well qualified to represent you there. That's what I want to do. So if you haven't already voted, please go vote for Delvin Chubb. Thank you. Charles Terry, uh, currently serving two House sessions from, since 2010. You're going to hear a lot tonight about uh, the theme of leadership. And I think the best indicator of a good leader is outcomes. If you look back over my record in two sessions, you can see that outcomes promised is what I delivered. We, we voted in a uh, water funding plan since 1999, last session. We actually reformed education where it's less testing and more relevant to teachers and employers answering the call for better trained students coming out of high school. On immigration, I was the first to lead out in a tuition um, credit ending bill for our state institutions, basically beginning the process of cutting off the magnets that serves as a draw. On immigration, we increased border security funding because we knew the federal government would fail us. Anybody that's trained in the federal government system should be uh, it's not a real positive in the day. Uh, federal government's let us down, but we start, we, we voted to increase federal funding for board, our state funding because the federal government hasn't done its job. Voted for a voter ID bill, passed. Other initiatives, we actually did a $1 billion small business tax uh, rebate. We actually uh, strengthened TRS, Texas uh, for Teachers, uh, teacher, teacher Retirement Systems Annuities. We actually increased funding for that and made it more stable. Um, as a CPA, I've dealt with thousands of counts over the last 30 years, and I know for a fact how overburdened some state and federal regs and tax systems are to just the average individual taxpayer, the average individual business, and how much of a job killer it is. So I get what's important when it comes to small business. And probably one of the most proudest achievements, and it was strictly related to you guys, I was able to pass a veteran's tax credit bill giving you property tax relief if you're a disabled veteran and receive a house donated to you. That was my bill, carried all the way through to a constitutional amendment. That was one of my proudest points. With that, I think my time's about out. I appreciate it. All right, we'll move into our questions. Mr. answer first. If elected, what's the first bill you introduce to the Senate? Well, I think it's going to be immigration. I think immigration, uh, illegal immigration is on everybody's mind. I'm just telling you, we probably all travel uh, most of, if not all, the 51 counties, and people are worried. It, 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 the number one job of, of an elected official in government is to keep its citizens safe. And uh, the federal government has abdicated its, its constitutional responsibility. So what are we going to do? We're going to leave. 
so we, we, we've got to we've got to keep the boat from sinking first and foremost we've got to fly the uh, and uh, we've got to put more troops uh, you know boots on the ground train law, more law enforcement I commend Governor Perry for his leadership bringing the National Guard we have got to stop the bleeding first but it's a two-prone approach the next is cut the magnet turn the magnets on it's supply and demand there's a demand for a better life in Central and South America. And as long as we're supplying taxpayer-funded benefits and services to those people, they're gonna keep coming. Doesn't matter how high you build the fence, how many boots you put on the ground, that's the most expensive part of the problem. So you gotta shut the magnets off. And uh, when you do that, then you'll know better who's coming over here for a better quality of life and who's coming over here to do us harm. So that'd be the number one piece of legislation that I'd work on. Question. By the way, this this microphone is bad, so yeah. that's why we're going up and down. Um, immigration is good, but folks, it's not going to pass uh, because the Democrats are going to. The first thing they're going to say is racist, you know. And anybody who stands up, you know, especially a politician, if you know that your politician is going to back down. If you send me there, I'll fix immigration because I'm not going to back down. But again, it's not going to pass because a lot of folks are just they don't want to go there. Uh, we don't know who's coming here. But we know that they're already here. They're in West Texas, they're, uh, they're in America, and they're working for somebody here. Wherever you're at, wherever employees are at, they're working here, and they're working illegally. So, I mean, to say that, that we're trying to stop them at the border, that's a new business, and President Obama's not doing his job, and it's just costing us a lot of money to send troops. So I don't agree with, uh, with Governor Perry, because I've been there, and we've done that with George Bush. You know what? George Bush was enforcing the laws. So George Bush was enforcing the laws, Governor Perry was helping out, and it was a win-win. Right now, we're spending money with troops over there, and you know, they have to have time off. They're not there securing the border. They, there's, they're, they're work recycled, you know? They're working and then they're off. Uh, so it's just a waste of money, and uh, what I'd like to focus on, I'm gonna skip the, you know, I wanted to share that with you. Uh, what I want to focus on is, is taxation. Lower the taxes, let, let us keep more of our money. We can spend it better. The government, you know, should come last. It's we the people. Immigration is a big issue and it always will be. But I introduced a bill one time that clearly defined that an immigrant that's here illegally is a trespasser and should be arrested, returned wherever they came from immediately. And presently, our local authorities can't arrest them unless they're committing a crime under the local law. And I think they should be arrested immediately when they cross the border. Turned over to the Border Patrol, and they should be returned to wherever they came from. Federal government should be billed all these costs, and we should subtract the costs from any remittances of taxes that we send to the federal government. It's their responsibility. They have failed, and they should pay. Hands down, immigration is going to be one of the biggest issues we face as a state going forward. We've got to continue to dedicate the resources necessary to combat that. Number two, we need to harass the cartel at every level, make their lives miserable. We need to forget about the federal government. They've shown no capacity, not just in the Obama administration, the Bush administration, every administration before that for the last 30 years. They have done nothing but you know, basically walk away from that obligation on the border. There are bad people coming in the state to do bad things to this, this state from an economic perspective. It's costing me $12 million a month to fund the DPS deployment. It's costing me $1.3 million a week to talk to DPS and the Texas Rangers, uh, the National Guard deployment a while ago. Uh, also, they're going to cost me $50 million. 4,200 kids entering our public school systems this week that came from that migration north is going to cost me $50 million as a state. It's time that we as a state decide that the federal government's checked out, not going to do their job, stand up, and then beg for forgiveness later, because I'll tell you what's at stake. Our way of life in this state is what's at stake. And if Texas goes, so does the country. If the country goes, so does the world. That's what's at stake in this on the immigration side. Other initiatives, I think we need to follow through on HB5, tremendous education reforms that we started, giving employers hope that they'll have educated and trained kids ready to go to work. We need to follow through on that, fund that education. We have a few other things in water initiatives that we started last session. We need to follow through and make sure these municipals follow through on Prop 6 funding and get that in place so that our water needs are met in the next 51 counties that we're serving. Mr. 
guys. Do you support the rose bush blocker or two thirds rule? Uh, that's where we're at right now. Uh, we have to think about that, and, and, and here's why. Uh, at the federal level, you, can, you remember Obamacare. Some of you liked it, some of you are like, what the heck is going on? Uh, they changed the rules, and they ran that, that, and that legislation, and it passed. You know, we have bad legislation. So, the two-thirds rule protects us, but it also hinders us, and that's why we at least need to consider what are the, the ramifications. Uh, currently, there's a lot of legislation stalled, you know, because you can't get everybody to play, play nice, nice with each other, you know, and, and the people get upset, the politicians start pointing fingers, you know, and sometimes they do this on purpose, you know, they, they, they craft legislation that they know is not going to pass, and they get with their buddies, you know, on the left or on the right, and, and they fool us, and we believe what they're doing, that, oh, you know, it's so difficult to pass legislation. No, it's not, you know. Give me a good a piece of legislation, I guarantee you it'll sail through. Put a lot of junk in there, and that's where we, people start wondering, well, I didn't vote for this legislation because it gives, for example, uh, immigration the right to vote. It's stupid, I just made that up, it sounds stupid, but that's what our politicians do, and they're used to deceiving us. It's, it's a deceptive practice that they do, and again, we're over here thinking that they're working for us, and they are not. So, uh, so again, we need to we need to at least look at that two-thirds rule and see maybe it needs to come down a little bit, so that uh, you don't want to just ram legislation. You know, we want good legislation, but you also don't want to be standing by waiting for something to happen. Could you restate that question, please? Do you support the Rosebush blocker or two-thirds rule? But I support what? The Rosebush blocker rule. The rule. Oh, sure. I would be supportive of two-thirds vote. I've watched that over the years. It's a safeguard, it's beneficial, and it keeps from wasting a lot of time on issues that never passed. So yes, I would support it. Two-thirds rule is a little bit of an insider baseball at the, at the Senate level. It's a way for the minority position to be protected from something that could be bad. I personally think that we need to have a great debate about it with the current incoming Senate class being majority of a Republican party, i.e. maybe 20 Republican senators. We would probably need to look at that and not go from a two-thirds to zero, but maybe to a 60%. But let me tell you what's at stake here. The, 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 the great debate of the day is not really ever a DRR issue in the Senate. The great debate of the day is usually rural versus urban. If we lose the ability to defend rural initiatives by having that two-thirds rule removed without any thought, then I will promise you that Houston, Texas, this is not an exaggeration, will be looking to have water from South Plains shipped to them. So on a rural versus urban issue, it is imperative that we have the ability to block rural versus urban issues at the sake and protect rural West Texas. Because that is what is at stake here. DNR issues on social issues, we win that battle every day because we're a majority party, thank goodness. We're a party that, that uh, honors the sanctity of life, and that's the way it should be. But on these rural and urban issues, we typically pair with the people in the valley that may be democratic, but they have water issues the same as South Plains. And to give up that defense of a rural issue without a whole lot of thought and consideration to it would be very irresponsible and probably put us in a very perilous situation on the South Plains. So I don't think the two-thirds rule, rule ranks up there with immigration and water and improving our schools, but, but it's an important debate to have. And I, I'm, I'm open to lowering the two-thirds threshold. I, I mean, democracy is based on majority rule. And if the majority of Texans want their legislature to debate an issue, tee it up for decision, and make a decision, and solve a problem, then, then that's what we ought to do. So I think, I think we do have to be careful on, rent, on the 51 sort of simple majority uh, you know, people ramming things through, but I think 60%, and this has been something that's, that uh, that uh, Dan Patrick has talked about, and I think he's thrown out 19, which is a little over 60%. I think that's 
I think that's a reasonable threshold uh, that to, to, again, to debate and make decisions based on the will of the majority of Texans. That's democracy, and I'm open to that debate. Mr. Jones. Do you believe parents have a fundamental constitutional right to direct the care, control, and the upbringing of their children? And if so, how does that relate to education? Should I believe the constitutional right? Do you believe parents have a fundamental constitutional right to direct the care, control, and upbringing of their children? And how does that relate to education? I can't understand your question because there's too much background. Um, parents have the right to I think the parents should have the responsibility, not only the right, but the responsibility of raising their children. And if they choose to send them to a private school, that's their choices. But I don't advocate using tax money to pay for private schools because the most successful ones are church related. And if they start taking tax money, they will soon lose their uh, independence of teaching what they want to. I don't think that would be fair to the children. Thank you. I agree with Del, and it's not only a responsibility, but it is a right that we should have. You know, in this state, from an education perspective, we have homeschool, charter school, public school, and private school. There's never been a more flexible opportunity for parents to choose how their kids are educated. Very supportive of that. Very supportive parent parents' rights. The, in the last session, we had a great debate over their, who gets to control the kids, and they're pushing for a grandparent right. They're pushing for a lot of different areas, but the beginning and end of who has control and has responsibility for the rearing of that child is the parent. But on the education front, I think Texas has got it right. It provides a plenty of opportunities for kids to have choices of where they want to go and parents to have choices of where they put their kids. So, the best way to empower parents is to empower local school districts. Give them the authority and flexibility on curriculum and on accountability. The best way to make sure that we're having the quality of education for our kids is to keep it local, where the school boards are elected by you and me, not some commissioner of education that's appointed by a governor. So I think local control is imperative, and uh, I think it empowers our, our parents, um, and I think that uh, we all have a stake in public education. I, I believe that it's fundamental. We all have a stake. We either pay a little now or we pay a lot later in social services, incarceration. And uh, you know, we're only as strong as our weakest link in that too. So I believe in a strong public education system. I believe we ought to keep the monies there. I, I believe in choice. I think choice is great for parents. Choice is competition. Competition breeds excellence, and it also lowers the cost. So uh, strong public education, local control, that's empowering parents to help raise their children. Now, this is a tricky issue because you have a lot of people pushing for you know for education to stay in a certain you know where it doesn't change uh, it's heavily uni unionized um, something that y'all don't know about me is that my wife is a letter carrier she delivers mail she walks the streets delivering mail she's a, you know, a union member but she doesn't agree with all the policies of the union you know where they like to take over and they like it's our way or no way you know where they hold everything hostage well in the teaching in the education field, and again, I, I teach at the university level as an adjunct, but you all know that, uh, that the unions have a lot of control, you know, and they don't want to give that up. So it's kind of difficult, you know, you, you want to, you know, say that, yeah, I'm for the families, but then we're funding, you know, the unions at the educational level, and they're just totally destroying everything, you know, any hope that we might have. Uh, I believe that, you know, if you want to homeschool your folks, do that and teach your kids what. If you want to uh, pay private school, you know, do that. I did that for two years, uh, three years in, in Plainview. I lived in Plainview for 12 years. And PCA is where we sent my, our son, he's 21 years old, 
and he, he did great at PCA. When I changed him back to a public school, it kind of dwindled. So, you know, we can't say that one is good and the other was bad. All education, as long as we try, and as long as a parent has the right to, to choose, we'll be okay. But we can't let the unions dictate. And I love, you know, unions, they do their job. Mr. Perry, if elected to serve the citizens of a border state, how would you respond to government operations which cause nationwide concerns such as wide receiver, fast and furious, and the federalization of law enforcement? Well, I think it goes back to what I said earlier. I think it's time for the federal government, well, let me rephrase it. It's time for the state government to take control of that border issue. Jurisdictionally, we're not allowed to do that as federal government. We have a federal government that's checked out. So we, number one, we put the state resources necessary to go after those elements that are creating this migration to the north. You know, they're not bad people. They've literally been ran out of the culture of their life and their, and their uh, jobs. So the economic viability of staying in that country no longer exists. So we need to hit the cartel head on. You know, do we cross over and go after them? I don't think we do that as a state today. But I'm telling you, if we wait too much longer, we may not, we may not have an option. It's about time that we have to draw that part of the line. So if we give the resources to the local and the, and the state and the federal, and we push for federal interaction, the locals can make that cartel that we know where they reside today, life's miserable. Cartel's a business decision. They go with the path of least resistance. So if we make it less ability or less successful to do business in Texas, then they will move somewhere else. That's not the solution I'm seeking. We need to get rid of this element for the good of the country. But well, we need to develop that process, and we are having good people down on that border to do a good job. But their hands are tied. They're operating under a federal system that says you can only go this far. But we need an actual deterrent deportation strategy that ultimately, at the end of the day, makes the cartel's life miserable. So we need to develop the resources to do it. And then we need to sue the federal government to get those resources back. As soon as this administration's gone, we'll get a check back, I promise. <laughs> Whether it's fast and free, furious or the IRS scandal or Benghazi, we could go on and on about the failures of the Obama administration. But this one is this illegal immigration and the, the lack of border security and the, and the lack of integrity that our federal government um, is operating under with respect to their constitutional duty is jeopardizing the folks who are on the front row, like the citizens of Texas. So again, we've, we've got to do everything within our power and, and, and marshal the resources necessary, and we need to keep the receipts. And we need to send the receipts back to the federal government. I'm not gonna hold my breath on whether they're gonna cope, but it's important that when the federal government fails to do its job, we put the safety of the citizens of Texas first. And then again, I go back to um, the, the magnets and supply and demand. You've got to shut off the magnets so you know better who's coming over here and what their intentions are. So this goes back, in my opinion, to the issue of border security and illegal immigration. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the... Uh, we're, we're, I think we're attacking the wrong place. And, and I'm gonna, you do not hear of illegals dying over here, okay? They're not dying of food. And I'm talking about here in the United States. They're not dying because they're, they're lacking water. Uh, you would know that they would be dying and there would be a problem. And they're not because they have jobs here. They have homes here. Uh, they can buy cars here. They're driving on our roads. So we made it easy for illegals to just roam throughout. And then we, we cry, well, it's at the border, it's at the border. It's not at the border. It's our neighbors that are hiring. You don't, you don't know how many contractors. And Charles, I'll tell you, one of the guys supported you. And, but he was like, well, we need those, we need illegals here to do our job, to build our houses, you know, to, to do that kind of, some of those guys are good. They can build some nice houses. You know, they can do some concrete work. They can build roads. They're trained folks, but you know, they're here illegally. So that, but who's hiring them? Again, it's our neighbors, our neighbors. And then we, they want to tell us, well, the, these are the good illegals. These aren't the bad illegals. You can't distinguish folks. I'm an infantry officer, okay? And I'm also a civil affairs officer. I don't know how many of you know 
that just south of uh, you know south of Mexico, there's some bad people over there from other countries that don't like us, and they're being trained there. You know, just like you see the training camps uh, across the road, they're there. It's so easy for them to cross up and down. And folks, if something bad happens, that's Obama, and that's us. So we need to fix that. First thing I want to clear up is my hearing aid problem that compliments World War II every first time I heard <laughs> the tail gun fix out with machine guns and powder noises, and we had no earplugs. If we didn't use the earplugs, we shut out. So I apologize for having difficulty, but there's a lot of back sound that overrides hearing that. And this question related to immigrants getting citizenship, there's a free procedure for it, and I certainly believe that procedure should be followed. Yes, would you? The, the question was, uh, how would you respond to government operations such as live receiver, fast and furious, and federalization of law enforcement? Federalization of law enforcement? I still think we need to maintain our own law enforcement. We need the state rules to prevail and the local rules to prevail as far as our sheriff's office and our city police. I'm a great believer in local control. Mr. do you think property owners' water rights should be subject to eminent domain? <clears throat> I think um, uh, we need to protect the private property uh, owners' rights to their property, which includes the mineral rights and the water rights, right to capture as well. law. Um, and that's the first, uh, that's the first point in the several points of a good statewide water plan. And from the perspective of West Texas, we've got to keep Austin from reaching out and trying to manage our water. That needs to be local. That's how you balance that. That is, you balance it by letting local water districts decide what they're going to do with respect to any restrictions and how to conserve uh, their, their water. The, the people who have the greatest stake in the sustainability of this limited resource are the farmers and ranchers. When the water runs out, they go out of business. So I, I fundamentally believe that the people that are closest to the problem and have the greatest stake are the best to manage it. And I will fight hard to make sure that Austin stays out of our water business and that we respect and protect private pop property owners rights and their water rights folks how many of you have called on told on your neighbor that he was watering you know when he shouldn't be you know that's us against them well he should be watering farmers have figured it out i mean they've been doing it for a long time they, they've got the no-till you know they did that for a while and also center pivot irrigations, you know, they even have the, uh, the drip line, you know, or the drip irrigation. You know, they figured it out how to, to conserve water. And yet, you know, some of y'all that, that are just, you know, uh, property owners, you own a house, you see a ditch or some water running, and you think that farmer is wasting water. Do we really waste water? I mean, does water vanish? Does it disappear? Folks, we move to look for jobs. You know, a lot of you will move to New York, California, wherever you can find a good paying job. The same thing was with uh, the gold rush. You know, there was gold, people moved, and then when it was gone, people left. You know, do we want to see that? No, but I'm in transportation. I ship things. You know, we ship milk, we ship fuel, we ship uh, water. So, I mean, to scare the people, you know, there's a lot of people that don't own a lot of land, and there's not a lot of farmers. Well, you all will win, you know, the populist will win always because there's more of y'all, more votes, and the farmer will get left out. Well, guess what? The farmers are feeding the world. They're not feeding regions. They're feeding the world. And we're all happy, you know? And we want to control the farmer's water. Why? Let's not fight about that. It's their water because when they come for them, next they're going to come for you. Most of the eminent domain, but I'm also, I passed a constitutional amendment and legislation that says that taxing entities such as the public area 
whenever they take farmland in and increase the value above its farmland value, they cannot tax it to the point that they can force the owner to sell it. That means that you presently have a farm value on every piece of land in the state of Texas. And if some taxing entity increases that value above the farmland value, they will not be allowed to tax it to the extent they can force that landowner to sell it. So I'm a strong believer in property rights and I'm opposed to confiscation of property by any agency, whether it's through tax increases or government. Well, I think uh, in the next session, you're gonna have a great debate on statutory taking. And what I mean by that, but if you're listening very carefully, there's a very clear distinction between my position on water and the other people on this panel. Number one, state law. If you if you sit on top of the groundwater, you own it. Period. End of discussion. That state law has been verified as recent as 2011 with a day case. Here's the deal. There are going to be rules implemented by water districts, and they are local controlled and voted in by local, local people on the ground. That's the way it can be administered. But here's where I'm unique. If you statutory re reduce the ability of that farmer or that producer or that entity to use that water, for instance, today's 20 inches and the rules come in, you can only have 15. We have taken five inches of what that farmer could have had to use to produce his crop that may not, not be economically viable. We have to develop, and it will be challenged in the court going forward, a formula on how you compensate that formula farmer for his loss. And that's Property Rights 101. The only thing that separates us from other countries in the world is the ability to own, create wealth, and build legacies through property rights. And it's gonna come at us from the federal government through the Department of Interior, the lizards, the minnows, the chickens. It's coming at us from navigable water legislation from the Clean Water Act in the 70s. We are under attack and under siege for property rights. But on the water issue, the distinction characteristic is I recognize the conservation efforts that are coming. In the event that they're implemented on local control issues, then that farmer must be compensated for that loss. Mr. Garza, I'm still on water. How do we secure water for our future? Again, uh, we can figure it out. Uh, I don't know how many millions of dollars we've already spent. We get T-Boom taking so much money a couple of years ago from Amarillo and uh, there's so many farmers from Amarillo to here that could have said, hey, instead of me planting corn, I'm gonna sell you my water. And the, the farmer would have done okay, and the people here of Lubbock would have done okay. It would have been a win-win. But uh, I don't know what's going on, but we, there's simple solutions. You could just address that and say, hey, if you want to, if not, if you wanna keep planting corn, cotton, whatever it is that you plant, you know, because there's a drought, folks, there's a drought. And how we check for, for water loss is there's holes across you know the region and people stick a you know a stick down there and then they pull it out and they say okay well it went down this much folks it's not a tank a tank you can do that and you can come up with you know there's going to be some evaporation but that's not a tank you know well the Ogallala goes here or the Ogallala there's you know 100 uh, feet there's so much water a thousand feet you know two thousand feet I don't know we try to figure out how much water is out there like we're God. You know, I get on my knees and I pray to God and I've been praying, you know, this year. Uh, and notice how green it is. Now, it's not me, folks. It's a lot of people that have come to me and said, hey, we all need to pray. Yes, I get on my knees and I pray for water. Is that silly? It's, it's working, folks. Uh, how many of us get on our knees and pray and ask God to pass it over? Do you know? Uh, sadly, not too many people believe in God. And that's okay. It's all right. can't create water, but you should preserve it. Do anything you can to preserve it and not waste it. I helped organize my main water district when it was called factory to try to tell farmers how to space their irrigation wells so they wouldn't damage the underground water formation. And it very specifically was organized by farmers like myself and others. But we very strictly put in there it should be regulated by a board elected by the property owners within that district. And that board should be the only one that can draw up rules about the use of that water. And I still contend that's right. It should not be a state issue. The state should pay for research to try to develop other sources of water. But local water should be controlled by local people elected by the local property owners and developing rules that the property owners approve. 
Water uh, is the common thing throughout the 51 counties. As of tomorrow, I will have visited all 51 counties. If, 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 issues are. They are unique throughout the 51 counties, but water is consistent. Number one, we have communities in this 51 county district that has no opportunities other than an undeveloped resource, such as an aquifer, I mean a, a, a reservoir that's not been dug, or a reservoir that's dry. Those are the ones that give me pause. Those are the ones that give me heartburn at night when I go to bed, because you don't have a lot of options. They're at the mercy of a pipeline that doesn't exist. The other communities that are in my, my district have already taken some initiative. Desalination of the Dockham, the Santa Rosa, the same animal, uh, aquifer systems uh, down in the western corridor, Permian Basin, it's a little seabed brackish. The cost of being able to desalinate has come way down. $4.50 per thousand in Big Springs for desalination of brackish water. That's affordable for municipalities for the first time in the history of this state, and that technology continues to get better. So the answer, number one, is develop undeveloped resources. Number two, get the EPA, Department of the Interior, and all the junk that I mentioned previously out of the way. There is a reservoir that's been on the books in Abilene, Texas, just north, Cedar Ridge, that has been 30 years in the making and still is not dug today. So, you know, we've got to get the junk out of the way so that we can go ahead and develop the resources for the future. Seed technology, seed varieties continue to fund ag research to get our seeds where they can do more with less water. Those are always good ideas, but really develop undeveloped resources. Number one issue for our economic future. Number one issue. If I want my children to raise their family in the West Texas, like I have the privilege of doing, we have to secure our future water. And the number one issue, I'm going to say it again, because the tendency for Washington, the tendency for Austin, is to overreach into our backyard and tell us how to manage our waters. Let me tell you something. Austin managing our water means Austin taking our water. Austin taking our water means Austin taking our farms and our energy production. And so we have got to fight for our property and water rights, first and foremost. Secondly, we just passed a $2 billion water fund. $2 billion, constitutional amendment. And that's $2 billion that can help rural West Texas solve their respective water needs throughout the 51 counties. It could be well water uh, well fields, it could be reuse, it could be any number of, of strategies for their respective communities. But the point is our needs in West Texas need to be the priorities of our state if we want to continue to provide the billions of dollars of economic value back to the state. And then lastly, we need to encourage research and development of water technology. I'm going to go back to illegal immigration. What do you feel is the real issue at the border? And does Texas have the authority to The real issue at the border? The real issue is that these people are coming here illegally. They're not invited. They're trespassers. They shouldn't be arrested. They shouldn't be arrested. That's wherever they come from. And we should build that government or the federal government of those countries. Probably the first place is build the federal government because it's their responsibility and they have totally defaulted on it. The real issue is two components we've already talked about. There's a magnetic pull for what I call Mexican nationals. And then there's another draw for people that are literally moving their families to Texas or out from under the countries because of the safety, the lifestyle that's created down there by the cartels. You know, the real issue is ultimately as a country, we will go around the world spending a trillion dollars to help the oppressed, rebuilding countries and helping people. We will not spend a dime south of here doing the same thing. Until we get serious as a country, run the cartel out of that area, let those people go back, have American corporations go back as they were prior to the cartel problem, rebuild that system, rebuild that economic viability, give those people their cultures back, 
which they really don't want to be over, truthfully, if they had their choice. They really want to live in their own culture. So that's, that's the real issue, is the cartel activity coming up. And I think that uh, it's a little easy to just put it off that it's the federal government. The state of Texas has the right and the obligation that if the federal government defaults on its obligation to protect us from foreign and domestic enemies, then as a state, we have to protect our citizens. So we are closely coming to a point in time where the resources necessary to do that very function is upon us. And I will commit to you that the state budget will look different in the next session because of this issue. And unfortunately, there's only so much money, and it's going to be part of that equation on how we're actually going to turn the cartel back. But the day of talking about it and hoping for federal to come and help is over with. We don't have the luxury of going any further with this. Bush. But when he stood on the rubble and he told Americans, the first responders and every American of watching TV, he said, listen, I'm going to go after the people that did this. And as long as I'm your commander in chief, I'm going to do everything in my power, everything in my power, to make sure it never happens again. He took that, that role and that responsibility seriously. Then we have a president that comes down here to Texas, which is the new ground zero, by the way. And he does a fundraiser, a photo op, a press conference, and goes back to Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, this election is about leadership. Make no mistake, it's about leadership. And Texas is going to lead. That's what we're going to do. It's costing us over $10 billion. That's money that could go to my children's education and your family's health care. So we've got to do something about it. And we have to be careful, Abby, you're right, that we don't sound like we're hating. We've got to be, we're a compassionate people. West Texans are the most compassionate, loving, hospitable, generous people in the world. And we are a nation of immigrants. But we're a nation of laws. And we have thrown rule of law out the window. And it's time we put Texans first and we lead. Folks, I want to share something else with you. My dad was born in Mexico. My mom was born in Mission, Texas. I was born in Bakersfield, California. We, we, they used to travel back and forth to California for jobs, you know, in the uh, grape industry. And then we started coming here to West Texas, you know, we'd be holding cotton or whatever uh, produce was available. But my dad was an illegal before I was, way before I was born, but he got his citizenship, you know, he's, uh, he doesn't wave the Mexican flag around, you know, he's an American. And a lot of people who are here, they come illegally. And I've lived in Mission, Texas. I've lived at the border. I know before we used to have laws, you know, the employees. That's why I keep going back to your employees, our neighbors, you know. Their problem is taxation. And that's why they hire illegals so that, you know, they can reduce their burden. And that's why I'm telling you, our issue with, with taxation is it's not, uh, it's not, the magnet is there for illegals, right? But if we reduce employers' taxation, they don't have to go out and hire illegals. They can hire, you know, Americans. Right now we have so many people on unemployment or what, some kind of welfare benefits, you know, and that is wrong because those folks could be working, but yet they're not. So th there's something there that we need to address. Um, we need to fix this, the border. Like I said before, you know, there's some bad people uh, that can come and go as they please. And if something bad happens in one of our schools, and I dread this, but you, somebody just got their head cut, an American in another country, that was bad news. This question will be for Charles. Uh, which areas of the budget would you like to cut, and which areas do you think we need to enhance? Well, I think that versus cutting, I think I want to make sure that we're operating effective and efficiently. Budget breaks down pretty simple. $200 billion. We have $75 billion that goes to higher public ed combined. Here's the scary one, and this is the one I focus on, and I think as a state we should be looking at. $75 billion goes to health and human services. For the first time in the history of the state, last budget session, those two items were equal. So today, our welfare system and our entitlement process, which is growing incrementally faster than every item in the budget in my lifetime, 30 years or less, could look like the federal government and be broke. So I think as a state, we need to focus on the health and human services, and in that, we have great opportunity to espouse the Republican platform, which is independence, responsibility, and opportunity. 
And I think if we go back to some of the reforms I'm looking at through this interim, working with other agencies, we can get the working mom into a better position and get her out of that system if we're able to just tweak the system. And we've got to bend the curve, change the personalities and the dynamics of that generation where mom's getting a check from work instead of mom's getting a check from government and kids see that. So that's the area I focused on. I don't know that there's a lot of opportunity to just wipe a bunch of money off, but I do think there's opportunity to make sure that the outcomes we, we seek are getting met. And that's where I focused on over the last interim session currently up through the day on working on health and human services. oversight and accountability we have to demand uh, excellence and efficiency at our agencies across the board. I think we need a more aggressive Sunset Commission to look at what the programs, uh, the various programs and agencies, what their missions are, what their outcomes, their desired outcomes are, and whether they're meeting the need or whether we need to just take them off the books altogether. Um, I think we should also do a regulatory burden reduction uh, initiative across the board. We did that at the FDIC when I was chief of staff, and there is untold number of, of regulations and rules that are outdated, duplicative, and unnecessary. And that cost, guess where the cost goes? It goes to you and me as consumers. So, uh, so I think we need to look at that. We need to look at cutting taxes. We have been blessed. God has blessed Texas. And uh, we've got a surplus in, in general revenue. We have a surplus in the rainy day fund. And we need to make we need to do right by our by our great state. And we need to invest in the future of our great state. And whether that's water, whether that's immigration, or it's public schools and universities, we've got to we've got to get serious about investing in the critical infrastructure in these areas so we can continue to grow, first and foremost. And then we can look at giving some money back through the tax relief. I'm just gonna create an analogy of uh, a supermarket. You know, uh, Walmart, let's say Walmart. Walmart lowers the price of milk and they make a big deal about it. Hey, we lowered milk. But what they don't tell you is they raise the price of eggs. So at the end of the day, nothing changes. Everything stays the same. That's what. Our, that's what. That's the question right here. Well, what are you going to cut? You know, government. You know, your politicians are not going to tell you this. If, oh, uh, we have a surplus. What does a surplus mean to you? I have three jobs, folks, and a surplus means that I worked longer hours and I made more money. To the government, a surplus means that they took more money from y'all, and y'all seem to think that that's a good thing. We all. Oh, there's a surplus. That's a good thing, right? It is a good thing, but how did they get that surplus? It wasn't because they did something different. They just took more money. The taxes were too high. Right now, for example, the, uh, the federal government has a fuel tax. The state government also takes a little bit chunk of your money. You know, I'm in transportation, folks. The roads are bad. You've seen them. They're, they're bumpy. Well, who's not doing their job? Is it the local? Is it the state? Is it the federal? Somebody's not doing their job. But guess what? They're taking your money, and they got a surplus. That's a nice thing, right? Why can't they take that money? You know, not everybody buys gas. Lower your taxes for the upcoming year. They can do that. It's too easy, you know. But, oh no, that's a surplus. Now we have to spend it on something else. That money's never gonna go back to you. And the next time they cut something else, they're gonna raise something else. So, I mean, yeah, we, and they're, they're proud. We cut, we cut, but yet, look at what rose. Watch that nonsense, folks. You gotta watch that nonsense. And I wanna change that. Something that most of you don't know. Every one of the agencies that has a board supervising it has almost too much power. Anytime that the legislature is not in session, they can adopt a rule. And let's use TABC as an example. I mean, you have any liquor interest, you know about the rule. They can adopt a rule, and that rule has the power and effect until the legislature changes. I tried several different times to get that changed. I still want to stipulate, and we should demand it, that if bureaucracy adopts a rule, it can be in effect until the next legislature meets. And if that legislature does not approve that rule, the rule has to be removed and cannot be put back. But bureaucracy, through the big money donors, managed to kill that bill every time I brought it up. 
So a guy that's independent thinker and trying to limit bureaucracy has one heck of a job on his hands. I can guarantee you that because bureaucracy does not want to park any of their power. They want to dominate our lives and they want to set the rules that you and I live under. If you're a hairdresser, they can set the rules for the beauty shop. And then unless the legislature votes to rescind it, that is the rule. So that's one of my pet peeves. You rock to see runs this world and it's not right. Mr. Arrington, what would you do to restrain the federal government's overreach in Texas? Fight him every, every chance we get. I love what Greg Abbott says. He's got the best job in Texas. He wakes up every morning and thinks of new ways to sue the Obama administration. <laughs> uh, you know, they're, they're expanding their scope of authority over water. They're doing studies about seepage into drinking water from the oil and gas production, from the fracking. I know what they want. They want to shut the production down. But we're only pro providing energy independence for the rest of the country and billions of dollars. This Texas miracle, let me tell you something. It's a, it's a very intentional thing. There's part miracle, part intention. The miracle part is God blessed us with fossil energy. <laughs> And, it's, and it has contributed a great deal to our country, and it's the reason we have a rainy day fund to talk about, and surplus. So, but the intentional part is, we've kept our taxes low, we've kept our regulations low, we've kept frivolous lawsuits low. That's not a miracle, that is good leadership, and that's being intentional. And you have to chase the foxes out of the garden every day, every year, to make sure that we grow and we create jobs, private sector flourishes, we unleash the entrepreneurial spirit of Americans and Texans, and uh, we'll be in a lot better shape than this overregulation. Okay, how do you get the federal government out there? That's an easy one, folks, because every time the federal government gives you money, guess what? Sign on the dotted line, here's our contract between the state and the federal government. You will do this, 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 and this, and this. But the people over here, y'all, we want something. We tell the state, hey, sign this, sign this, sign this, because we want it. You need to watch out what you're asking for, because you're going to get it. Uh, and again, you know, you will do this, you will do this, you will do this. Let, let's talk about farmers, for example. It was so easy, you know, when they came out and said, hey, just put a meter and everything will be fine. Well, what have you done? You put a meter and everything's fine. You just, hey, self-report. Not a big deal. Just tell us how much water you use. We'll just keep the data. Not a big deal. And a lot of farmers did that. You know, they, they want to get in trouble. If you don't do it by, you know, next week or the next, you know, whatever, whatever the government is putting the date, you're going to get fined. We're going to come take your land. But guess what? There's a contract you just signed. Well, yeah, I'll put this meter. I'm signing. I'm reporting. Oh, wait a minute. You didn't report. So the federal government, that long, I don't know if you, how many of you have taken a law class, but it's the long arm of the law. What the heck does that mean? Well, the federal government's good at connecting the dots. You know, it's like, oh, well, you took this, you took this, therefore you should, you should be abided by this regulation. And you might think that, you know, that doesn't apply to you. Fine, settle it in court. Now it's gonna cost you more money, and then you might lose, because the federal government's coming after you, and they've got all the cash, and you're limited. When Southwest Airlines was trying to start, I'm one of the two people still alive who voted to let them have a permit from our Aeronautics Commission. And of course, immediately there was all sorts of lawsuits filed. Took two years, went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled that Texas could issue commercial licenses for airlines. And you can see where Southwest Airlines have gone. They went from one airplane to 360 or more at the present moment. Had the FAA had their way, South Air Southwest Airlines would never have started. So I'm an advocate of opposing federal intrusion and do anything I can to keep them from intruding on our business rights, our property rights, and certainly on our individual lives. 
Right. Thank you. Well, 35% of our $200 million budget is federal money. So it, you're right. I think bottom line, every time we go down that road of a little more federal money, we've committed to doing a little more federal work for them. Federal government's coming after us, I've mentioned it, BLM over in the Red River. They confiscated thousands of acres of someone that's paid taxes, has clear title to it under the name of the federal government they thought they owned it. Federal government's come after us on the lizard, the minnow, and the chicken. They're shutting down oil and gas enterprises. They're shutting down farmers and ranchers and cattle operations. They're coming after us on navigable waters, meaning that the ponds that are out here on the cattle ranches are now navigable waters, therefore they have control over them. They're coming after us on our energy supplies. Your energy bills under the current regs fixed to be implemented by the federal government will go up 20% over the next five years because they think they can. So really, we're left with this. The state of Texas needs to draw that line in the sand and say, we ain't going. Now, as the lizards and interior goes, actually the comptroller came up with a plan. We got the, the lizard removed from that list so that the Permian Basin could continue to drill. So we do have valid options, but I don't think the federal government's listening. And I really think that we're at that point where you sue and sue and sue. Not only on the important issues such as those others, but there's other more important issues. The traditional assault on family values, the definition of a marriage, sanctity of life that's been shoved down us as a state. We as a state must be the last state standing on those issues and those issues alone or we will lose our country because God will walk away from it. Mr. Garza, would you support legislation to give city governments the ability to increase the sales tax rate by 12%? Wow, that's a, that's a toughie, because the federal government is really making a mess of it. The state government is making a mess of it. City leaders, look at Lola, they're going to raise their taxes. Yeah, I want them in charge of that, right? You want them in charge of that? I don't think so. Uh, maybe we need, to, we need to make it where the voters, hey, raise your hand if you want your taxes up right now. And go ahead and write the check. I approve of that. You know, that way you're in control of how much money you want to give the government. Hey, if you see that there's a need, we need to fix a pothole, raise your hand up and write that check. I'm making a little uh, joke of the situation, but be careful of what we ask for, you know. Uh, if, if, you, if the people were engaged and voted people in that we're gonna do the right thing, it would work, you know, in theory, it'll get the job done. But there's some bad people, you know. Uh, they have these liberal ideas, you know, where, oh yeah, it takes a village. Folks, if y'all heard the story about the pilgrims, they come together in the Mayflower and they all form a compact and they say, we're gonna stick together and we're gonna get stronger. And you know, half of those people died right away because they, they wanted to eat, but they don't, didn't wanna go hunt. You know, so that social loafing, you get some people together and you say, hey, we're a team, right? You're gonna see that some folks are gonna pull on the wagon, other people are gonna get tired and say, hey, can I, can I just get on the wagon? Other people see that there's people sitting on the wagon, they too sit and get on the wagon, and before too long, the wagon stops. But there's gonna be folks that aren't gonna stop, they're gonna keep going, they're gonna be productive. Yes and no. To me, if all of your local people, including all your elected people and your grassroots, grass, Root support people indicate they want authority for such tax, I would consider it. But it would have to be one that was very strictly drawn. It would have to be one that this taxing authority could not use for other purposes. And it would require a total, a strong vote of the most local taxpayers to put it in place. But if local taxpayers are willing to vote a tax on themselves, then I would be willing to consider it, but it would be off our sale. They couldn't just count on me falling in line just because they said they like it. Uh, there's been a lot of ambiguity on that issue on this panel. I'm no. I've been no from day one. I'm still a no today. Number one, it's just crazy to talk about raising local sales tax revenue when there have been surpluses in local sales tax revenue because of an overheated um, oil and gas economy that's generated more and more sales tax. At the state of Texas, there was discussion in coming up in the next session to raise taxes to do roads at a time when we're having budget surpluses 
because of an overheated energy cycle. So it just is not logical to me, even if we were not overheated. You prioritize what is important, roads, bridges, public safety is at a local level. Outside of that, there's really not much you need to be doing. You know, the quality of life issues, the dog parks and all the cool stuff that people talk about wanting, private sector can fund those. You know, what the private sector is really telling you is we want the taxpayers to share the risk. In other words, we'd like to make all the money if it works out, but if it doesn't, we want to know that the taxpayer's on the hook for that. So if the private sector believes that it's good enough to do from a profit motive standpoint, let them have it. Outside of that, taxpayers don't need to be in those cases. We need police. We need fire. We need water. We need sewer. We need good roads. But outside of that, the government shouldn't be in our mess. And we have had record surpluses. And to have a discussion to raise taxes for those other projects where they could reprioritize the budget makes no sense to me. I don't think Charles and some of the folks on the radio hear me clearly enough, so I'm going to try to make it real simple. And I want you to hear me, and I want, you to, I want you to pull your dogs back, Charles. I'm against raising taxes, locally and at the state. Okay? I'm against it. And I'm proud to have served with the good people, the community leaders on Imagine Love. It was a grassroots effort to come up with a, a, a strategic plan to grow love of Texas. And you know what? Texas Tech didn't have a plan when we got here. And our enrollment was in decline. And our research was about 75 million. It's tripled that today. You know why? Because we had a plan called Leading the Way. We had a vision. For lack of vision, our people perish. We had a vision of how to grow tech and to leave it better than we found it and create millions of dollars in economic impact in this community and jobs. So, um, I'm proud to be associated with Imagine Lovin'. I'm proud to be associated with the leaders of this community and I am not for raising taxes. Got it? Mr. Jones, how important is it to you to identify with the Republican Party, and do you support our current state platform? To identify with the Republican Party, and do you support our current state platform? Well, of course, I think the platform was adopted properly, and it would be nice if I'm going to be a candidate that I should support. Absolutely support the state platform, and I think that we have an identity crisis in the Republican Party at the national level down. A lot of people don't even know what the proper and our platform stands for. I hear a lot of talk about quote, collaboration and working together, and on the big things in the state of Texas, fortunately, we're still able to do that. But at some level, the kumbaya moments can't happen. If they were going to happen on every level, and we were to coalesce around that idea, then we only need one party. And so there is very clear distinctions between Democratic Party and Republican Party, namely the sanctity of life, namely personal responsibility, naming economic independence. And those are things that we have seen one at the national level, they forgot. They want to kind of get warm and fuzzy with those people on the other side of that equation and say, oh, we can get all get along. But at the end of the day, what we've had in this country, we've all got along to the point that we're 20 some odd trillion in debt declining. We've got a military that's lost its status across this world because we've just let people to get along and nobody stood there lying in the sand and said, enough, enough of the charade. Twenty years ago, if we'd had someone beheaded as an American in important souls, the next day, that group would have been executed. Some way or another. <laughs> but we have lost our strength. And this world needs a strong and righteous America, and we need to stand true on our values, and the Republican Party in the state of Texas still mirrors that, and I'm wholeheartedly supported by that. conservative uh, principles and ideals in the Republican Party and how we've implemented that in the state of Texas has created what is the beacon uh, among the states in the Union. Like I said, God has blessed Texas. It's not a Texas miracle. It's Texas leadership. 
It kept taxes low, kept regulations low, re reformed our, our, our uh, civil justice system, and, and, and threw out the frivolous, baseless lawsuits. And so that, that, that is an intentional act by leadership in, in, in the state of Texas. And let me say this, I, I think leadership is also being very clear about something. The federal government, as we've said tonight, all of us, has failed on so many levels. And I'm frustrated. And you're frustrated. Every one of us are. You just want to throw your hands up. It's sickening. But we got to be real careful that we don't misplace our righteous indignation on the great state of Texas and our ability to work together to solve problems and move our state forward. That's leadership. That's leadership. And I support that style of leadership. You have to do it in your homes with your wives and your husbands. You have to do it at your places of work. You don't get 100% of everything and you burn the house down. That is not leadership. That's a principle I will lead from every day if I'm your next senator. Do you support our current state platform? I support it. Wow. Uh, do I support it? That means that I have to do everything that the GOP says that I that they support, right? That was a toughie because if you look at the national level, President Obama has just railroaded all of you. Why? Because the system that was supposed to stop it, the GOP didn't do, didn't do their job. Uh, and in Austin, it's the same thing, you know, I'm telling you, those folks like going to their parties, you know, they like to be, they play nice nice with the Democrats, liberals, it doesn't matter where you're at. But those folks will tell you what, well, I wrote legislation, did it pass? No. Okay, so what did you do for us? Well, uh, I wrote legislation. Folks, that's why I'm running, because I'm tired of the nonsense, and you're tired of the nonsense, you know. I wish some of y'all would have wrote the $1,250 check. I wouldn't have had to. I wouldn't have to be spending our money, you know. Y'all are over there deciding, well, who's, who's going to do a better job? Who's going to do it? Well, Charles has the experience. He's been in the house. Well, what kind of experience did he have before? Well, you know, Arrington, he's done this, you know. He's done that. Okay. Delvin, he's done this. Well, what have I done, folks? All I did is I wrote the check because like you, I am tired of the games that they play and they fool us in their truth, you know. And we're happy, yeah, they're fighting for us, they're writing bills, they're writing bills, you know, it's gonna do something. It never does because that click, you know, the party. So yes, I support the party, but folks, I'm not gonna just do blindly. This will be our last question, Charles. The Obama administration, and in particular the Attorney General, have taken steps to disregard laws such as the Defense of Marriage Act or forcing Christian businesses to provide for abortion or the morning after bill. How can we be sure that Texas continues to reflect Christian, pro-life, traditional marriage values? Fight, 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 fight. <clears throat> I'm proud to have the endorsement by the Texas Right to Life. I've probably ranked in the top three to five on every one of those issues. I'm not considered a voter. I'm an activist. And the reason I'm an activist is because that's God's greatest gift. When it comes to and we, when we that, that gift, we have basically said to God, your greatest creation is not important to us. So I, I'm 100% supportive. So what we will always have to be is fighting that battle, unfortunately, to a government that doesn't get it at the federal level. Texas, with their HB2 last session, put the model of the pro-life legislation around the country. Country, uh, every state in the union is modeling what Texas has done the last two sessions. First session, I actually authored the amendment to take $64 million out of Planned Parenthood. As a freshman, on the night, that was my issue. issue. HB2 that we came through. Everybody said it never happened. In Texas, and here's where I'm a little bit upset when you say you've got to get along with everybody. Had we got along with everybody, Wendy Davis would have been successful in defeating HB2. There's a point in time when you draw the line in the sand and we ain't going. 
So we just continue to have that battle. Traditional marriage is another assault on traditional family. Our country for two generations has seen the deterioration of a family unit by virtue of entitlement welfares that supplement the dad, take the dad out of the household, and we've got to do legislation that incentivizes marriage, traditional marriage, incentivizes those husband couples, wife couples, where they're basically back on their, 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 I'm sorry, time's out, but yeah, we just fight. I agree with Charles, we ought to fight, and uh, we ought to, um, the, you know, I mean, the basic building block of our society are our families and the traditional family, and I think the courts were wrong, but you know, the courts have been wrong on Roe v. Wade and a whole lot of issues that are important. I wish we could have some more state sovereignty, you know? I think if we had more control over our destiny and we let other states decide what sort of direction they want to chart, what kind of culture they want to establish, uh, we wouldn't be as polarized, I think, as a country. And Texas could continue to lead and probably lead in even greater fashion, unfettered by regulatory overreach and and an uh, activist Obama administration with all these executive orders and this judicial activism. So, yeah, these are fundamental principles in, in life, the sanctity of life. I mean, this is something we can all agree on. At least, Charles, you and I can agree on this. And I'm, I'm proud that the Texas Alliance for Life has endorsed me. Uh, uh, I think life is God-given. I think it begins at conception. And I think Texas has done a great job of promoting a culture that respects life, in spite of our courts system and the flawed rulings of uh, the likes of Will be White. Folks, I don't know how many of you, and I'm not attacking anybody, but you know, when you read the Bible, there's a lot of that stuff in the Bible. There's rape, there's incest, you know, there's murder. There's, you know, the Bible is not a happy story, you know, where everybody was singing Kumbaya and at the end, you know, they live happily ever after, okay? It's, it's sad. So, you know, when we talk about uh, abortion, you know, uh, or homosexual marriage, and we, well, you know, it's, it's just, until it happens, you know, I, I was fixing a point, but until it happens to some of y'all, you know, you know that person who decides to get an abortion, you know, it's their right. You know, and they might believe that abortion is bad. They'll, you know, their daughter has, you know, gets pregnant early on. You know, well, that would look bad, so we got to get an abortion. I know people like that, you know, and it's sad. So, you know, we want to protect the sanctity of life because, you know, life begins at conception. But, you know, there's some people out there that, that think that, you know, that bad is bad. Folks, rape and incest is bad. But you can't terminate life, you know, it's not the, the child's, uh, it's not their fault, folks. Adults make them, those bad decisions and, you know, we can't allow, you know, God to look down on us and say, what the heck are y'all doing? So, you know, and homosexual marriage is another thing, you know, it's not in the Bible, but I believe that if you want to do something bad, go forth and do good things, but we're not going to make that legal. I believe the majority of the people in the Senate District 28 are opposed to abortion as a means of birth control, and I agree with them. I am opposed to abortion as a means of birth control. That's just not right. And we'll start our closing statement. Excuse me, would the candidates be willing to field five minutes of questions from the audience? Y'all want to, I don't You're welcome to talk to them afterwards. We need to, to move on with our closing statements. Yeah, I've got some notes here, just some thoughts. Uh, you know, elections matter. You guys know that because you're here, you're engaged in the process. And, and leadership matters. And, it, and, and, and leadership has mattered in Texas. Like I said, we've been blessed with oil and gas, we've been blessed with natural resources, but it's been very intentional. And, and this election will set the course for the future of our region for years to come. Like I said at the beginning of my statement, Bob Duncan 
was our center for almost two decades. So we have to have the strongest voice in Austin. They're not thinking about us. We can all agree with that. They're not thinking about us. But we've got to remind them every day of the importance of West Texas. Economically, $100 billion that the ag industry brings to this, to this great state. Billions of dollars in oil and gas. But it's not just economics. It's an issue of our culture and our values and our way of life. I'm reminded that 90 of our framers of the state's constitution, of the 90, 49 were farmers and ranchers. Only 26 were lawyers. Think about it. We are quintessentially Texan out here. And somebody's got to bang the table when it's time to bang the table, have a cup of coffee with anybody who will listen. And if I've said it, I'll say it again. If they are an R by their name, or an I, or D, if they'll stand with me to fight for the things that matter to West Texas, private property rights, water rights, secure our border, improve our schools. If they'll stand with me, I'll call them my friend. I'll invite them out here for a barbecue and we'll clap together and say thank you for helping lead our state and make our communities in West Texas strong and prosperous. Folks, again, I'm just here because like you, you know, you want change. Um, hopefully we've, we've impressed upon y'all something that you're like, wow, you know, I really like that. Or, you know, some of y'all are just like, yeah, whatever. I'm going to vote for the guy that when I came in here, I was going to vote for him. And when I leave, I'm voting for the same person. Because I'm the partyist, you know, I'm, I stick for the party. That's okay. That's our choice. But, uh, I mean, there's just a lot of difference up here. And uh, some of you think, well, what does it take to be a sinner? What, can I be a senator, can I be a house, you know, can I go to Washington, you know, be a senator up there or a congressman, can I be president? Folks, you know, this is America, it's we the people, it's not we the government, you know, we the rich, you know, we the poor, it's, it's none of that, folks. So when you all look at me, you know, and you're like, yeah, I'm not gonna vote for that guy because he hasn't raised a lot of money. Yeah, I'm not gonna vote for that guy because, oh, he's Hispanic, or yeah, I'm not gonna vote for that. Whatever it is that you wanna look at, you know, all of us, I mean, and I'm just blanketing that statement. Folks, you all can make a difference. You know, it doesn't just take voting, folks, because some people get elected and then they forget about it. That's why I'm here, you know that. And that's what we need to change. That's all I want. I want our government to be for us, not against us. And yeah, they, we all have cute sound bites and you know, we think, oh yeah, that person is really gonna do good. Folks, it's not about that. It's for us to get engaged. A lot of people, what happens is they make this blanket statement that politicians are all crooked. They say stuff and then they don't you know, follow through. There's some validity to do that. But y'all have to stay engaged and keep voting, talk to your friends and neighbors, and make them change that approach, because until we do that, there's a lot of people that need to be recycled at the local, federal, and state level. We really, President Obama, for example, I wish the GOP had basically kicked them out, but they didn't do their job, folks. They're not doing their job in Austin. Please vote for me. Thank you. I'll try to make this very short. Most of you know that I've been successful in business. I've been successful in farming, and I've been successful in politics in 30 years of the House of Representatives. So if you are already supporting one of these other candidates, I commend you for it, because that's the way the system works. If you're not committed, I hope you will vote for me, because I would like to be your state senator. Thank you. First of all, it is a privilege to be up here with these guys. This is not as easy as it looks. Uh, it is a job and, it, and one that I'm privileged to have been served in a two-house session. I need to clear up a couple of things, and I hate to go here, but it's the truth. There are imposter organizations. Texas Alliance for Life and Texas Medical Association are not pro-life organizations. <laughs> uh, two sessions. Both of those fathers at every level on those issues, pure and simple. This is about leadership. I keep hearing this theme about leadership. Sometimes I sense there's an identity crisis. I have no identity crisis. I know who I am. 
I know what I stand for, and for two sessions, you can look at my record, look at my push cards, and you can follow through and say that I followed, I followed through. We funded water, we got voter ID, we increased border security ahead of what we thought the federal government wasn't going to do, which is true. So I delivered on the things I have. And, and you know, I go back to this leadership issue a little bit. There, there's some big names being thrown around. The people that have inspired me as a person I am today are the people that will never have a presidential library named after them. It's my mom and my stepfather that got up that were water meters for the city of Lutton Sweetwater, and she worked at Lone Star Gas Company raising five kids below a poverty level. It's the mom, it's the mom and pop shops that show up in my CPA firm and says, I need a loan because I have an idea and I'm ready to put it out there all on the line. And it's those people that have inspired me, that give me the, the passion and the ability and the desire to go down and fight for those people because at the end of the day, those are the people that matter with what gets done on a state level because they do what's right every day because it's the right thing to do. And those are the people I've taken my lead and my initiative and my learning, and that's what made Charles Perry today. Not a, not a big name that we've all been had the benefit of business. Uh, you know, Ronald Reagan, all of those guys, people we inspire to, 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 to look to, but they should not mold us. And I'm a product of my environment, and it is because I grew up the tough one. Thank you. applause for the candidates.